In this episode, we are going to do things a bit differently than usual. You have already noticed that I stopped using AI voices for this podcast, and like I said in episode 1 of this new season, I stopped using them because, first of all, the demand for my own voice for a narration by myself was actually quite high by you guys, and secondly, I suppose that talking by myself might produce a more familiar and personal tone, something that the AI could never manage to produce. But perhaps you would also like to hear something about myself for change, about my own history and the reasons why I am here, why I got here, why I am so active, or, well, most of the time, as active as I could possibly be on YouTube and social media, and also why I basically restarted this podcast thing. That means that in this episode, I might talk about a few specific historical topics, but honestly, I don't even have a script before me. And instead, I might actually combine a few historical topics like, you know, the way that Turkish history is being perceived in Western countries, or how one time, while I was actually studying history at university, I witnessed firsthand in class how a professor actually got Mongol history totally wrong. I'm also going to tell you guys and guess about the way that I produce these videos and how I do research and also try to explain certain aspects of my documentaries because I know that some of these are or have gotten very popular, which is, you know, a great thing to see. See that this hard work is actually paying off somewhat, but some of it is also rather controversial. So I'm going to go into detail there. But first of all, a word from our sponsor, or rather sponsors, who would be my Patreon supporters and all the members on YouTube. You can become a supporter on either of these sites, and whether you enter the lower tiers or the higher tiers, by your monthly payment you would basically support all of my projects, which also includes my upcoming book about the Gökturk Empire, a book that is basically a remake of the first original, which I had released in 2022, and exactly two years later, on April 11th, I am going to publish it in English and German simultaneously, and later on also in French and Turkish. And I'm very proud of this book because it is completely different. It has been written from the ground up, completely expanded in length, so it is more than 400 pages long actually. But my writing style is also completely different because the first book had actually been a sort of summary of all of my video scripts about the Gökturks, but expanded somewhat and with other important sources. And it has gotten quite popular, but the second book is more serious in tone. And I'm also more critical of the sources that I use in the book. So you won't just see a conglomerate of chronological events taking place, but instead I also question a lot of things. And there's also input by myself regarding theories about the Gökturks, which you guys already know, unfortunately have left us very few sources about themselves. And if you become a supporter on Patreon or YouTube on tier 4, you would get free access to this book digitally. So in digital form I'm going to offer it anyway on Amazon and of course also in print. But you guys have the chance to get the PDF file without any extra cost by becoming a tier 4 member on Patreon or YouTube. And with that being out of the way, let's start this third episode. My journey on YouTube and as a sort of YouTuber and even video producer started about four years ago, on January 30th, 2020 to be exact, where I uploaded my very first video documentary called Rise of the Gökturks. And I had been inspired by some other YouTube channels and also by a Turkish filmmaker called Alpa Çala. And I had started to do some research about the Gökturks in 2013 already, basically when I started studying at university. And over time I borrowed a lot of history books and old texts and also got into, into researching actual historical primary sources of late antiquity and also the early middle ages. And I found out that basically no one on the internet, in the English language, had been able to portray the Gökturks as accurate as possible, but also as interesting as possible. So these were my two main goals. To explain what the Gökturks had been all about, and also to reach as many people as possible by making the video as 
interesting as possible. That being said, back then, my capacities had been rather limited, I had been nothing more but a mere student in this final semester, and I had no prior knowledge about video production whatsoever. Like, I had downloaded Adobe Premiere Pro many years ago when I was in school, actually, and, you know, had done a bit of experimenting in that program. But aside from that, you know, aside from producing a few so-called movie trailers or video game trailers in movie style, just for fun, just as a hobby, I didn't really know what to do. And nonetheless, I started doing some research and writing the script. And then I purchased a program, or rather entered a subscription. And after a few weeks, my video had been ready. And it had garnered quite some attention, I think more than 1000 views on one day or after 24 hours. And after that, I uploaded a second episode and, and that was watched by like 200 people, I think. That was kind of disappointing. And by that time, I of course noticed the severe lack of actual depictions of the Gök Turks or in general ancient Turkic peoples, but also Mongolic peoples. Uh, even, you know, from the Genghisid Mongol period in the 12th and 13th centuries. And that, of course, made it much harder for me to actually make more episodes because I was forced to use the same images over and over again. And the images that I used in my videos, of course, had been made some, by some other people. And wherever possible, I gave credit to them within the video, of course. But yeah, they didn't look like I imagined the Gurk Turks to be, and they certainly didn't match the descriptions of the actual primary sources about what the Gurk Turks looked like and possibly how they behaved. So there was a very long break, and then I translated the first Gurk Turk video into German, just for funsies, and interestingly that kind of picked up and I got a few thousand new subscribers. And a year later, in 2021, I decided to make a so-called movie, a longer video documentary, about 90 minutes long, about the entire history of the first Gök Turk Empire. And that movie was quite successful. And it was the first video to gather more than 100,000 views in German. And I translated the video into several languages by using AI, of course. And back then I had already access to some well, actually rather nice and um, perhaps not so subtle AI voices and I made the same video in Spanish and French and Turkish of course and all of these videos had gotten more than 100,000 views by the end of that year. This of course reinvigorated my interest in well restarting this can't stand project on a more sophisticated level and with a more serious tone although it had been rather serious anyway and in 2022 I did a lot of you know experimentation regarding AI imagery and AI voices because I knew that by using my own voice and because I didn't have good equipment back then, people wouldn't really turn in to watch the videos. And 2023 was the breakthrough year basically because I was able to use AI image generation software and AI voice or voicing software, voiceover software in a way that you people and in general those who didn't even know about my channel who stumbled upon my videos for the very first time, that most of them would not even notice. Because now AI technology had reached a new level, a sophisticated professional level. And I made a lot of videos last year in 2023. And I also started going into other directions, you know, talking about stuff aside from the Gök Turks and Tengrism and so on. And I made a video about the Huns, the very first Huns, the Xiongnu or Hungnu, which was pretty popular. Then I made a follow-up video about the Huns in Europe and the Caucasus, the Huns of Attila. And that was even more popular and I think by now it has gotten more than 200,000 views. And I made a video about the Hazars, which has gotten like half a million views by now, which is, you know, absolutely crazy. And by the end of the year I decided to make another video series about the Gök Turks, but by using this new technology and of course also as being the rather experienced video production guy by now. But these videos didn't garner as much, as much attention as I had hoped and I noticed that the most popular of, I think by now, the four episodes that have been released, the most popular was the first episode and the most interesting topics, according to YouTube analytics, were cultural actually. 
Yeah, people cared about the parts where I talked about Tengrism once again, about the old Turkic, uh, the ancient Turkic lifestyle, the Töre, the traditions and the law of the ancient Turks. And that is basically when I stopped uploading new documentaries. And I had like a few weeks of brainstorming ahead of me. And I thought about ways how I could make the video production process easier for me because creating all these things takes so much time, you know, and my time is rather limited because what I think I have never talked about is the fact that I also work full time. So I have a full time job. It's like 40 hours a week, sometimes more, sometimes less, most of the time more than just 40 weeks, uh, 40 hours, of course, a week. And obviously that is that has the highest priority, right? But this constant project is also more than just making videos because as I told you in the intro, I also wrote a book and published it two years ago. And now the second book is also about to be published in April. And I also got into this, I don't know, business of AI imagery. I don't know why, because as I said before, I had no prior experience to all of this, to any of this stuff. I'm not a programmer. I'm not a usual artist, I didn't go to art school or whatever, to art college. But I think I know what would be fitting in a specific context for a specific story. And I also think that I know what people would like to see and also what they would like to hear. Because if you listen carefully in the new videos, you will notice that I use some pretty cool music in the background, which is of course never too loud, not to, you know, uh, over to the actual narration, you won't find this music anywhere else. So I'm also proud of that. And now we are in 2024 and I'm in the process of resuming this video production thing and I'm going to upload a few new historical documentaries, of course, because I decided to leave the Gökturks behind once and for all. Once this book has come out, I probably won't be talking much about the Gökturks again because there's so much more to Turkic history and also in general to steppe history that I want to focus on, you know, other peoples, other nations, other kingdoms and empires and tribes, and also about a few cultural aspects. And the next video is going to be about the Bulgar Empire, the very first Bulgars who, you know, you could count sort of as the ancestors of the modern Bulgarians, but perhaps not, we see, but of course, very important for modern Bulgarian identity. Uh, these were the very last people who spoke Uguric Turkic and who created an actual empire, a large and important state. And I think that their history is kind of underrated, so I decided to tackle that topic. And right after that, I'm also going to upload another documentary about the Majars or the Magyars in English. I don't really like the pronunciation. So about those who shaped Hungarian identity. Both of these peoples either appeared during or after the Gökturk Empire on the European continent. And they were both affected by the fall of the first Gökturk Empire. So these new videos will basically, without much conflict, resume at where I left off last time. Whether the Magyars could be counted as Turkic, we'll see. Surely the Bulgars were Turkic, and there are also a lot of other peoples on the Eurasian steppe belt that were also able to found new empires and new dynasties following the fall of the Gökturks, which would also include a few tribal federations in the eastern part of the steppe, in East Asia, and modern-day Mongolia, and also in Manchuria. And I'm also going to talk about them a few weeks later, and we will slowly but steadily continue our journey on the timeline from late antiquity and finally once and for all enter the middle ages the middle ages are in my humble opinion as i said uh, you know this is nothing written in you know engraved in stone or anything like that and it might even be a controversial opinion but in my opinion the middle ages from 1000 to 1200 were the golden era in turkic history in all of turkic history why? I would like to explain in another episode on this podcast, perhaps. So now you basically are up to date with what's been happening on Khan Stan. And if you didn't know my story beforehand, I've mentioned it a lot of times in the past on social media. For those who don't follow me and don't want to read between the lines, I graduated in political science and history at a German university. 
a few years ago. And many think actually that because I studied history at university that the knowledge that I possess, not only but especially about Turkic history, would kind of stem from that time. Which I need to admit at this point is unfortunately false. Nothing, and I repeat, I stress, nothing that I have ever talked about on Khan's then or written about on Twitter or Instagram or wherever. None of that is information that I got while being at university, while studying there, regarding the actual subjects of history at that certain university. And the subjects were antiquity and the Middle Ages and the contemporary era, but the Turks, for example, were not even mentioned once in all of these, I don't know, three or four years? I think I studied for like three years, yeah, and then got my bachelor's degree. The Turks were not even mentioned once, not even the Ottoman Empire, which wouldn't be a big problem because I didn't go to university to focus on Turkic history. I wanted to know about all of human history. And of course, studying all of human history within a few years is basically impossible. But I was kind of naive at that time, at the beginning, I guess. And I really thought, and many other students too, many of my friends who st started studying with me, we all thought that we would, you know, get a glimpse of all of these important civilizations all across the globe. And you know where history started in the very first semester for us? Like thematically, we didn't start like in Egypt or in the ancient Near East with the Sumerians and Assyrians and so on. We never even talked once about China and India, by the way. We started in Greece and then we moved on to the Romans. And that was it. That was antiquity. That was the first part, the first semester. And in the second semester, we moved on to the Middle Ages. And in the Middle Ages, we talked a lot about Europe, especially Germany. Well, some might say, what's so special about that? Because when you're studying history at a German university, it wouldn't be obvious that you would especially focus on German history in that time period? Yes, of course. But the problem here is that the lecturers also wanted to talk about stuff that happened not in Germany, but on the borders, on the edge of the European continent. Or for example, in the Near East, like the Crusades. And I tuned in to some of these seminars and many of them were actually interesting. But I remember one seminar where the Middle Ages in general were sort of thematized. And I remember one scene on one faithful day where the lecturer, the professor, a lady, would speak about food in the Middle Ages, in modern day Germany. So she was all about, well, we all talk about the, the, you know, the important powerful men, the rulers and the nobility of that time period. But what about the commoners, right? What about the peasants and the city dwellers? How did they live like, you know, how was their lifestyle? Um, what did they eat? How did they work? How rich were they or how poor were they? How was their condition? Did they have any political rights and so on and so forth? You guys should know that civil rights in the Middle Ages was rather limited everywhere, but that did, didn't even bother me. Actually, I was kind of interested in that part. But for some reason, in like the second hour of the lecture that day, of the seminar, the professor changed the subject and suddenly we weren't talking about food anymore in medieval Germany. She started talking about the Mongol Empire out of nowhere. And that was kind of cool because I really had thought that if the Turks wouldn't even get mentioned at all at the seminar, then certainly the Mongols would be left out. But the professor said, well, the Mongol Empire was the largest empire of all time. I suppose she meant as a continuous empire. And it would certainly be important to at least talk about that subject for a few minutes. Okay, good. But uh, back then I already had some knowledge about the Mongol Empire and knew some historical background facts. And I thought to myself, how is she going to tackle the Mongols in like a few minutes? So she would have to summarize all of this history and, you know, in a very compressed manner. Maybe she would give an overview, but she did not give an overview. What she did was show one or two maps to show how big, how large the Mongol Empire had gotten at its largest extent, which, if I remember correctly, was in like 1280 or 1290. And that was, of course, cool for all of us to see, and especially for those other students who didn't, or, you know, perhaps had heard about the Mongols once, but were not able to grasp what they were all about. But then 
she said something about the fall of the Mongols and she mentioned that it would have started, you know, this, this decline, this period of decline of the Mongol Empire would have started in 1241 after the Battle of Liegnitz. So the Battle of Liegnitz took place in the western part of modern day Poland. And she claimed that the Mongols would have been beaten by a joint Central European army consisting mostly of Polish and German warriors. Which is, excuse my language, bullshit. The Mongols were not beaten at the Battle of Liegnitz. To the contrary, the Mongols won. They won overwhelmingly against the European forces, which also included Hungarians, by the way. That was it. She laid out her claim. She told everyone that the Mongols had lost that battle, which, okay, maybe it was a small mistake, you know. I mean, what is a battle out of 200 battles that the Mongols conducted in that century alone? But she added that this would have started the period of decline among the Mongols because after the Battle of Liegnitz, the Mongols would have retreated from Europe back to the steppe and that the Mongol Empire would have fallen shortly thereafter, which again is rubbish. Yes, the Mongols did leave shortly thereafter, but you guys know why? Because their leader, the great Khan, had died, he had passed away. And it is tradition among the Mongol Empire, and it was also tradition back in you know, the Uyghur Khaganate and also the Göktürk Khaganate, that if the great Khagan, or Khan at that time, died, then the Kurultai, the National Assembly, would have to convene, and at that National Assembly, all the nobles and especially children of the ruler who had just died would have to come together and decide about succession. So that was it. That was the reason why all of these high-ranking generals who had been mostly sons of the ruler left Europe and also you know, the Caucasus area and parts of the Middle East. But temporarily, they would come back later and wreak even more havoc. I mean, they did, right? After they returned, they sacked Baghdad in 1258. And the Mongols were indeed stopped a few years later, but that was in 1260 at the Battle of Ein Jalut in Syria, in modern day Syria. And the Mongols were not beaten by a joint, I don't know, Polish, German, Hungarian army, and certainly not by Crusaders. They were beaten in battle by Kipchak Turks, now called Mamluks, who ruled over Egypt. And of course, this is something that the professor didn't even talk about. She basically closed that book you know, close the PowerPoint presentation, then reopen the other PowerPoint presentation from before, and then she continued talking about, I don't know, you know, food in general in Germany. I thought to myself, what the hell was that? And I noticed that the people, I mean, there were at least a hundred students in that class, they gotten a bit uneasy, and I don't really know if they understood that what they were told was wrong, but they were certainly amused by the fact that apparently food was more important than this major ass empire called the Mongol Empire to the professor. And I'll tell you what, I graduated and I got some good grades and this is the one scene that stick with me from these three years of history. And it was at this time where I said to myself for the first time, maybe it would have been better if I was standing there in place of that lady, if I was the professor, the lecturer. Because it is true, back then I didn't even have I would say 20% of the knowledge that I possess now, but I knew back then that the Mongols had not lost the Battle of Liegnitz in 1241 and that the Mongol Empire did not collapse shortly thereafter either. So at least I wouldn't have told the students any wrong information. And to this day, I don't even know what happened there. I'm not sure if it was just a mistake and if the lecturer simply didn't notice, but then again, you know, she didn't really seem like an uneducated person. So maybe, just maybe, a conspiracy theory of mine, she did it on purpose. But I'm not claiming that, of course. I'm not claiming anything like that. I just asked myself this question shortly thereafter, and this happened like 10 years ago, and I still haven't forgotten about it. And it's not one of these bad, horrible stories. It's not even really funny if you weren't there. If you are in a student of the game, like I am, a student of Turkic and Mongolic history, you might have laughed your ass off, but thinking about it 10 years later, it's kind of saddening. And this is something that I stumbled upon very often at university, but also in media, you know, in the media that I consume here, in the books that I bought, and of course, many books that I borrowed from my time as a student at university. 
while I got access to some very interesting sources that I had never even heard about, which also helped me write my Gökturk book two years ago, and still helping me out to write my second book in 2024, many of the books that I got my hands on contained wrong information. And sometimes it felt like this wrong information wasn't just put there by mistake, but that the author had sort of created this narrative to paint certain people in a certain way. And I hope that by now you guys know what I'm talking about. This is especially true regarding Turkic and Turkish history. And I've wondered for a very long time why when I read books written by German historians in the early 20th century, in the first half of the 20th century, why they differ so much from the books that I read from authors who published their books in the second half of the 20th century. So before the Second World War and after the Second World War, I don't know, things are just massively different. And I'm not even talking about some sort of, you know, propaganda by the Germans in a certain time period in the 30s and 40s, but uh, at least in the books before the First World War and following that in the 1920s, I sort of notice a peak of interest by German historians and intellectuals in ancient Turkish or Turkic history and also ancient Mongolic history. And then later from the 50s on, this interest just declines and I'm still not sure why. And in 2024, you won't find any book about ancient Turkic or Turkish history in any German bookstore, I guarantee you that. I don't know how things are in other European countries like France or Italy or Poland or Sweden or Liechtenstein, I don't know. But this is a very alarming trend and this is the second reason why I was motivated to write a book on my own. The problem with my book is, as I said, that it was basically a summary of the video scripts that I had sort of rewritten and in some parts massively expanded in the final print version. But I noticed that writing a book, of course, is a much different task than making a movie or a video documentary. And that's the reason why I also took some inspiration from some of these, you know, older books from older times, perhaps more interesting times, not only from German, but also from German authors. And I said to myself, all of them are very serious, but they're also open-minded back then. And I should be open-minded too, and I should question some things. I shouldn't just write down what I have read in some ancient source and assume that everything that was written back then is correct. And you guys know, of course, and I knew before too that we can't trust all the ancient and medieval sources. But then again, we can't work without sources either. So we have to find a middle ground. And finding out what is true and what might be wrong is very difficult. The best thing you can do is read a source, but not once. Read it twice and three times and five times and ten times over the course of many, many months and even years. And try to understand what the author was perhaps, well, trying to say back then by comparing it to the books or works, the texts of other authors in the same time period. And this is what I was able to achieve, even with regards to the Gökturks in the 6th and 7th centuries. And translating these ancient Chinese sources was certainly not an easy task. But again, thankfully, I have some good translation software and I double checked and translated back and forth to assure myself that the translation in my book would be correct in English. And for the first time ever, I also got critical about the Turkic sources themselves, about the Orthon inscriptions. Like 10 years ago, after I left that seminar from that strange professor and got kind of angry that, that she basically told a lie about the Mongol Empire, a few hours later I would be back at home and read about the Gökturks on Wikipedia or some book that I had borrowed from university. But what I read there, I took at face value. And I didn't want to make that mistake again. And I took a lot of time to analyze the other inscriptions in the translated versions, but also in the ancient Turkic version. And I found out some very interesting stuff that nobody else has ever mentioned in any book, in any way, shape or form. Not in the Turkish language, not in English, certainly not in German. And I hope that you guys are excited about this book. I certainly am. Again, it's going to be released on April 11th. I think that's a first day and it's going to be released on Amazon worldwide in English and in German simultaneously and you will be able to order a print version but you can also buy the ebook on Amazon and on my own website. 
because I am finally able to go commercial on my own personal website, kansden.net. So it's Kans then, like the name of the channel, .net, where I also already offer the first book. So if you just need a simple overview, but with a lot of sources to read uh, about Turkic history, but not only Turkic history by yourself, you can already purchase my first book for like 10 bucks on my own page. And due to the fees that I have to pay Amazon, it's a bit more expensive over there, of course. The third and last topic of this episode is something that I have had on my mind for a very long time and that I've never talked about really. And it's the question of how we should depict Turkic deities in media. So how did or what did Turkic deities, what did Turkic gods and goddesses look like? Mm, we don't know. I mean, I don't know. Do you? can't because there's basically no description about them no original description but i stumbled upon some paintings or drawings of turkic deities nonetheless that were very modern in tone and that kind of looked marvelesque like some sort of marvel comic with some science fiction um, elements and these images are being used right now especially in turkey as a sort of standard reference for certain Turkic deities like Umay, the Turkic goddess that can be equated with Mother Nature, the one goddess who's supposed to support mothers during and after birth and give life to the children later on. And she was depicted as some sort of, well, I don't even know if I'm allowed to use these phrases here on the podcast without getting delisted, but let me just say that I certainly didn't like the way she was depicted. I noticed that a lot of other deities, but all of them women for some reason, were depicted in a similar way and that was kind of disrespectful. In my opinion. As you guys know, I am capable of creating some very sophisticated images by using AI software in a way that you wouldn't even notice that it had been made by an AI. So I thought to myself a few weeks ago, how about making images that show these deities as I see them, but perhaps in a sort of abstract way, so that not all details are revealed, and that you as the viewer and reader of my book, of course, and of these Wikipedia articles, where I would love to post these images, you can still make up your mind about how they, you know, how their faces would look or how tall or short they would be. I just want to give some sort of concept art, basically. So make some cool images, but not too sophisticated, not too detailed to leave some room for your imagination. That's what I would certainly like to do. But what I need to know beforehand is, would you like to see something like that? Or do you think that I should keep my hands out of this topic? Because I myself, I'm ready, but I'm not sure if the people actually want something like that. So let me know in the comments on YouTube and, and you can always send me a message on social media. I'm also on Instagram and on Twitter where I use either the same or similar handles as I do on YouTube. And I suppose that we have reached the end for today. So thank you very much for joining me on episode 3 of the new and improved Can't Stand podcast. This time without a script. Just with me talking what's on my mind currently. And I hope that you guys are able to understand my thought process a bit better by now. You definitely know my motivation. And you also know that I get especially motivated each time someone likes a video of mine or subscribes on the podcast, on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or of course on YouTube. So if you've been following me for some time and you haven't subscribed yet, just do it. Thank you very much. And if you want to go one step beyond, you can also become a supporter on Patreon and YouTube membership and support this cause, which I see as more than just my hobby. It's sort of my passion, actually. And my goal is to reach as many people as possible and educate as many people as possible about, first and foremost, ancient Turkic history and the original Turk way of life, but going one step further about ancient peoples in general. That's my main motivation. I don't want these people to be forgotten and I'm using these images to give them a face. Again, not the deities, that would be disrespectful in my humble opinion, but I want you not only to know what Bumin and Istemi said or wrote on some stone stele, I also want you to understand that they were humans just like you and me. But simply stronger, tougher on the battlefield, being able to ride horses, being excellent blacksmiths, and of course being legitimized by Tengri to rule the world.